By 1983, downtown New York's avant-garde theater scene was already well established. Companies like the Wooster Group, Mabu Mines, and the Living Theater were creating shows that rejected the realism of mainstream Broadway fare in favor of more experimental work, gaining critical acclaim and a highly engaged audience. One of these audience members was David Byrne, the lead singer for The Talking Heads, who would take what he saw in the downtown theater scene and spin it into a show that would captivate millions around the world. For the most part, when someone sees a play, they expect a story with the beginning, middle, and end, characters they can relate to, and a world that feels real. While some downtown shows would satisfy this idea of a well-made play, it wasn't uncommon for none of these expectations to be met. In this sequence from Rumstick Road, created by the Wooster Group in 1976, in the midst of a recorded interview being played over classical music, a woman thrashes her body forward and back, while Spalding Gray, the central performer of the play, dashes back and forth in the opposing room. If these two are playing characters, it is unclear from watching who they are, or what role they play in a traditionally structured story. Not too many years after I started performing in a musical group, I started going to like downtown experimental theater in New York, um, which kind of blew my mind. I didn't know theater could be like that. There were things that had no narrative, but still held my attention, and I realized that what I was doing on stage was a kind of theater, very artificial. The minute we step on stage and these lights hit us, it's theater. In summer of 1983, the band had just released their third album, Speaking in Tongues, and Byrne was developing the stage concept for their upcoming tour, which would later be immortalized by Jonathan Demme in the concert film Stop Making Sense. Byrne would draw on many of the ideas he saw in downtown theater, bringing them to a new context, the concert. Unlike a play, in a concert, none of the expectations of a rigid story exist, which meant Byrne could draw on the aesthetics of downtown theater without any of the risks of alienating audience members by subverting their expectations. The presentational style present in many downtown productions can be seen in the main arc of the show, the creation of the concert itself. Beginning with one person on stage and slowly building up the members of the band and the set, exposing the operation of the lights and the activity of the backstage crew. In the past, Talking Heads had performed in full wash stage lighting, leaving the stage more exposed. But this was another level. With this technique of bearing the device, the audience is made critically aware that they are watching a show, and of the effect of each new performer or element on the stage, and then, as the show progresses, of the full effect of these elements when they're used together. Simultaneous to this arc, Byrne approached each song as its own play, drawing storyboards for each, imagining the lighting, set, and blocking of the performers. He showed these storyboards to the tour's lighting designer, Beverly Emmons, who had previously worked on Einstein on the Beach, the opera by Robert Wilson and Philip Glass, and other theater productions. Some of the designs employed harsh lighting and projections, while the design of This Must Be the Place was made to suggest a living room. This sparse stage design, featuring the band, a single lamp, and projections, would evoke a living room if it was seen in a theater production but it is far from the amount of detail necessary to get an audience to suspend their disbelief and believe the people on stage are actually in a living room. I was kind of very excited and informed by a lot of the New York downtown theater stuff, which was not naturalistic in any way, shape, or form. And I thought, well, that works for a pop concert too. We're not trying to pretend we're in a living room. We're accepting the artificiality of us being on stage. Burns' abstract dancing blends perfectly with the concert setting, where it would cause tension if we were supposedly watching how a person would act in their everyday life. Instead of having to fit into an imagined reality, the actions on the stage can happen only for their own sake, and not for that of an expected plot or character arc. These absurd movements occur throughout the concert, perhaps most noticeably when Byrne runs laps around the stage. Byrne rehearsed his movements alone in his apartment. The movements that he eventually settled into in the show are more akin to interpretive dance than they are to organized steps, with most of the movement being completely divorced of a clear connection with the music, presented for its own sake rather than that of a larger narrative. In 1981, Byrne worked with choreographer Twyla Tharp, creating the music for her production The Catherine Wheel. This experience not only gave him a broader understanding of movement on stage, but also practical experience in staging a production. I got a taste of how a show like this got put together from watching Twyla manage all that. It was incredibly influential to me because not too long after that, I started working with Talking Heads on stage in the show. Aesthetic influence came from Japan as well. When I was touring, 
uh, I started going to see theater and various kinds of things in other countries. I went to see a lot of Japanese theater where there was no or bunraku or kabuki. Mm -hmm. And I realized that what I was doing on stage was a kind of theater. The big suit, which Byrne wears in the final section of the show, was also inspired by the wide, playing card-like costumes in no theater. It gives Byrne a larger-than-life silhouette, providing a fitting visual to the artificiality that was so embraced throughout the concert. The extent of the theatrical intent behind the Speaking in Tongues tour is evidence of Byrne's deep interest in the art form which was soon to take much of his attention. By 1983, Byrne had already created music for the Catherine Wheel and was just beginning to work with Robert Wilson on the sprawling epic Civil Wars. He had even invited Mabu Mind's co-founder, director Joan Akalaitis, to watch rehearsals of the tour to provide feedback, further solidifying the theatrical approach. Byrne's interest in theater was taking center stage, exemplified in the concept for what would be the Talking Heads' last major tour, brought from its inception in downtown New York to concert halls, then movie theaters, all around the world. 